Modern warfare is utterly terrifying for many reasons, but one of the main fears of the modern battle space and in civilian life is the Unmanned Aerial System, or UAS. Drones have been a fear for many since the days of the global war on terrorism, and the recent wars in Nagorno-Karabakh and in Ukraine have proven just how deadly small, consumer-grade UAS platforms really are. So today we're going to quickly go over some tips and tricks for evading UAS platforms. This video is really meant to be a quick guide, so we're not going to go into the intricacies of each UAS platform in existence. Rather, we're going to cover the basics and some immediate actions for evading UAS platforms. Remember, based on how quickly UAS platforms have become a huge problem in warfare, the doctrine on this topic is still being written right now. Even currently, US military doctrine on the topic is really lackluster and sort of a last-ditch effort to address the topic. So just keep that in mind, drone doctrine is nowhere near as solidified as something like small unit tactics or other basic infantry skills, which have more or less been set in stone for decades. Drones use in war is relatively new, and though there are volumes written on active and passive UAS defense based on a variety of factors, the doctrine put forth by the powers that be is still very much up for debate, especially the stuff in the public sphere. And all of this is very much affected by recent developments in warfare, so just keep that in mind as we go along. So to begin, what do we mean when we say UAS platform or SUAS, small UAS platform? Well, really what we're talking about is any small, usually man-portable, unmanned aircraft. These days, we're usually talking about quadcopters in most cases, but this category can include things like the classic Raven system or commercially made Parrot fixed-wing systems, things like that. UAS platforms are usually only used locally, controlled by a single user with a hand controller. However, many systems are capable of autonomous flight, which would only require the user to set a series of waypoints for the UAS to fly to. For the sake of simplicity, this can also include loitering munitions. Now, loitering munitions vary in many ways from UAS platforms, and they are not particularly new, but their extensive use in Ukraine and in Karabakh has raised many eyebrows. As a result, most counter-UAS doctrine has been tailored to apply to loitering munitions as well, because the defenses from such are mostly the same all around. Another thing to get out of the way is, what do we mean when we say evading UAS platforms? What exactly are we evading? In warfare, small UAS platforms, such as quadcopter systems, have really been used for two purposes, observation and kinetic targeting. Within these two categories, there are various subfields, so let's talk kinetic targeting first. SUAS platforms can be used for targeting in many ways, but the main uses of which are the following. Sacrificial attacks, in which the drone itself is usually loaded with explosives and deliberately flown by an operator into a target, detonating the explosives and sacrificing the UAS platform in the process. This form of attack might seem costly, as the expensive drone is lost. However, considering that this style of attack can achieve the same, or sometimes even better, success than a several hundred thousand dollar precision guided small diameter munition, well, the cost of losing the drone is insignificant. Historically, we have seen this style of attack most commonly in the Middle East, mostly Syria, Iraq, and Yemen, in which insurgent groups would use this style of attack to target various targets. The other style of attack is munitions delivery. In short, the UAS platform physically carrying a small munition, usually a single hand grenade, or a smaller mortar round, or even an improvised munition, and then dropping these munitions over a target using both the GPS position and the onboard camera as a crude aiming device, and also to document battle damage. This style of attack was again popularized by insurgent groups in the Middle East, but recently has been all but perfected by Ukrainian forces fighting Russia. Videos abound on the internet of soldiers using dropper devices on consumer drones to drop RGD-5 hand grenades on Russian troops with shocking accuracy. So those are the two main ways these small UAS platforms can conduct kinetic targeting, both of which have their benefits and downsides. Flying munitions directly into a target sacrifices the drone, but can be way more accurate even against heavily fortified targets. And, since factoring in a return trip is not necessary, users can effectively double the range of the drone. On the other hand, dropping munitions from above saves the drone, but isn't conducive to a large payload, and is arguably more inaccurate. But other than kinetic targeting, SUAS platforms have an arguably even more deadly mission. Observation. Again, within this use case, there are a lot of different practices. 
Up first is the least deadly, Standard Observation and Intelligence Collection. In the United States, this is the most common domestic use of such UAS platforms. Small quadcopters are used by everyone from law enforcement to nosy neighbors to get a bird's eye view of their local surroundings. This can bring a lot of different problems. Camouflage is a big concern, as is movement and vehicle positions. An adversary can gain a lot of information about a military force from a drone that they bought on Amazon. But speaking from the military side of things, drones that are purely for observation can be dealt with. Effective camouflage, discipline, and constantly changing positions all drastically reduce the effectiveness of drones that are solely meant to spy on you. By the time the intelligence is collected and processed, it's already stale because you have moved. But there's the problem. When that sucker whizzes by over your head, you don't know if it's merely trying to spy on you or if it's being used to direct artillery. Yes, besides just spying on you for intel purposes, the other main use for small UAS platforms these days has been for the directing of artillery. Now this is a huge topic. Artillery observation is no joke, and there are volumes of doctrine about it. But in actual warfare, we have seen a wide array of uses, ranging from formalized and proper observations, to the Ukrainian or Russian equivalent of Bubba sending up the drone to see if the enemy is in that trench over there, and if they are, hanging a couple of mortar rounds on that position. In the Ukrainian conflict, Russia in particular has been very fond of this tactic ever since the initial invasion in 2014. A commonality that has withstood the test of time is Ukrainian soldiers and Western observers noting a UAS flying overhead, which meant that they had just a few minutes before the artillery bombardment would be impacting their area. For the longest time, the mere sight of a UAS was enough for soldiers to hunker down or evade at high speeds from the area, which is a sentiment that has heavily influenced the doctrine on this topic to this day. So all in all, there are a few reasons as to why a UAS platform might be observing you. It could could simply be observing you in the traditional Orwellian sense, or it could be trying to drop a grenade on you. There's no real way to know for sure in warfare, but the history of your local area will be a good indicator. If you are in New York City, for instance, that's probably the police spying on you without a warrant. If you are in the Donbass, well, it would be safe to assume that a grenade or an artillery strike is about to hit your position. So you can see that these different potential uses make it impossible to create blanket doctrine for all UAS encounters. In some situations, it would be best to hide from the drone and wait it out, but in other situations, waiting it out might turn into a non-survivable artillery barrage. So taking all of this into account, Account, what general tips can we come up with for defense against small unmanned aerial systems? Number one is pay attention. Arguably the hardest thing to do these days, simply paying attention to one's surroundings is one of the primary ways that UAS platforms will be detected by the average soldier or citizen. Fatigue, working parties, conducting personal hygiene, and any other number of tasks that are conducted in combat zones can be a distraction. Do not become distracted. I know it's easier said than done, but remember how important this is. UAS defense should not be treated like we treated indirect fire or IDF attacks during the GWAT years. Dudes would not even get out of the rack for a rocket attack most of the time, and complacency was rampant. These days we're entering an age of more near-peer threats. And just like we're finding out in Ukraine, seeing a drone overhead very likely will result in a full-on artillery barrage from multiple batteries. And I don't know about you, but I never want to find out what it's like to be on the receiving end of a battery of rocket artillery. So take it seriously and pay attention. Number two is operate at night or periods of limited visibility. Despite all of the hype surrounding drones these days, they are not the boogeyman. They can be defeated and in 99% of cases, the kryptonite for the average drone is weather. Like we've said before, weather is the biggest limiting factor for most military operations, but especially for anything that flies through the air. Low cloud ceilings, heavy fog, or really any kind of precipitation severely degrades most unmanned aerial systems. Now the caveat to this is that small Small quadcopters almost always fly beneath cloud ceilings. So if you've got an overcast sky at, say, 2,000 feet, sure, you'd be pretty well sure that most high-flying assets won't be up, but most quadcopters are going to be flying at, like, 1 to 200 feet. So the whole cloud ceiling consideration is kind of irrelevant for these kinds of platforms. However, what is not irrelevant, at least not yet anyway, is darkness. 
Simply put, most consumer grade UAS platforms don't have infrared or thermal cameras on them just yet. Yes, the technology exists and you can purchase drones right off the shelf with this technology right now. And most police departments in the US have this exact technology. But for the average person who orders a drone off the internet to include most of the ones we've seen being used in actual warfare, they just have a normal day TV camera. This is why operating or maneuvering at night still might be useful even in a near pure situation where neither combatant truly owns the night. Will operating at night be a foolproof way to prevent drone attacks? No, but it's better than doing nothing, and darkness can severely degrade the capabilities of most civilian consumer grade drones that are out there. And since these are the kinds of drones that are still heavily used in war, darkness is still helpful. But then again, darkness can also bring a false sense of security, so you have to weigh that as well. This will not always be the case, and in just a few years, it's very likely that thermal cameras will be standard on even the cheapest civilian grade quadcopter. But for now, we can hope that the Amazon specials we're seeing all over the globe remain the de facto standard for a while. Number three is maintain proper dispersion. There is a reason that this has been a basic soldier skill since the invention of artillery. Dispersion is the act of spreading out the location of forces so that they are both harder to detect and also more difficult to target with a single munition. In other words, spread out and don't clump together. Again, easier said than done. In combat situations, it's not exactly fun hiding in a hole alone getting shot at but sometimes that's exactly what's needed to ensure the best chance of survival. And this does not only apply to active combat zones, but even civilian life as well. Humans are social creatures, and it's only natural for people to want to hang out together during down times or during meals or stuff like that. Don't let this turn into a vulnerability, even if all you're doing is hiding from police drones in the park. Number four is practice good OPSEC. Again, the Ukrainian conflict is proving just how important OPSEC is and how much of a liability smartphones are in the battle space. Military commands around the world have seen how simple social media posts have resulted in the deaths of many, and OPSEC has finally been realized for the significant threat that it is. However, all it takes is one person to mess it up. A commander who makes all of his troops leave their phones at home and screams at them for hours about the importance of OPSEC going through mandatory PowerPoint trainings, but in the end ends up taking his own phone to the field, well that's not going to end well. OPSEC has also been a bear for the special forces community for years, with egos being mostly to blame. Not pointing any fingers at any particular unit or situation, but OPSEC is kind of an all or nothing thing in these situations. When it comes to specifically UAS concerns, the proliferation of UAS platforms at even the squad level means that units and echelons that previously would have zero intel collection capability now have tools at their disposal. For instance, imagine a squad that's holed up on some hilltop somewhere on an observation mission. They've got a few guys, some basic optics, and some basic electronic surveillance or direction finding gear. Well, in years past, if they picked up any transmissions, the best they could do is log it or maybe radio it in. And maybe their division could get a theater level asset to collect on it in a couple of weeks. But now we're in a situation where if the SIGINT dude picks up some hostile chatter from that hill over there, they can now quickly put up a drone and go check it out themselves in a matter of minutes. So with regards to OPSEC, we don't just have to be concerned with satellites or regional ELINT collection threats, but we've also got to worry about the Rifleman Squad having similar capabilities. And number five, use camouflage, concealment, and decoys effectively. UAS platforms are rightfully some scary things, but again, they are not without their faults. And by and large, the camouflage doctrine that's been in existence since World War II is still very effective in most cases. Camouflage your position at every opportunity and always practice the best tenets of personal camouflage. In keeping with the theme today, this is yet again easier said than done. Camouflage is almost never a priority in garrison environments or even in some combat situations. Remember, a massive danger for armed forces today is to be perpetually stuck in a training mentality, a mentality that transfers over to actual combat situations. Yes, training is good, but when the chips are down, it's time to drop the notional mentality. This is not really much of a concern for a civilian populace, as we don't have to worry about someone yelling at us for painting our rifle or using the right camouflage for the environment. But for the average citizen, the discipline of sticking with camouflage and constantly improving it is just as difficult as for the soldier. 
So at last we come to the question, what should I do if I see a UAS? Thankfully, all of this prior doctrine will help us make that decision, because as you can see, the answer to that question is highly dependent on your situation and location. So for us, one of the first immediate actions upon seeing a UAS is to stop. Stop all movement and seek immediate cover if possible. Even if you have seen or heard a UAS platform flying nearby, the operator might not have seen you. But if the operator has seen you and the drone has a grenade that the operator plans to drop on you, chances are you're not going to have much time for anything other than dropping to the ground like you would for any other IDF situation. Remember, even with autonomous flight, we're playing the operator as much as the sensor platform itself. So even if your adversary can play back the footage later and clearly see you, we have to remember that in most cases, the operator is using a small phone screen. And based on what we know about the human eye, we know that humans are most attracted to movement. So keeping still can be a huge benefit for avoiding being detected in the first place. And in a lot of cases, the drone is already gone before you can even figure out where it was. Number two is to hide. If it is clear that the UAS has seen you, or if it is orbiting around you, conceal yourself from its view. Chances are you are not going to know what kind of sensors it has on board, so preparing for the worst case scenario, a, a thermal camera, is probably the best course of action. Really, any physical barrier between your body heat and a thermal camera will provide effective camouflage. Just make sure to not touch the material and convect your heat through it. We will touch on this more when we talk about thermal camouflage. Next up is weight. Most most UAS quadcopters have a relatively short flight time, with even top shelf models really hovering at around that 30 minute flight time. If the drone is carrying a payload, the flight time will be significantly shorter. So in many cases, you can simply head indoors or hang out in a protected structure until the drone is gone. This is most helpful in the domestic United States where we don't have to worry about kinetic targeting just yet. But in areas in which kinetic targeting or artillery observation is a concern, waiting might be counterproductive, especially especially if you are in an area that is not survivable in the event of an artillery barrage. In that situation, it might be better to transition to the next tip, which is to move. If you are in a combat zone with a history of UAS platforms being used to direct artillery strikes, it might be better to maneuver to a more survivable location if you see a UAS. This will of course be highly situation dependent, so listening to those who have more experience in that particular area would obviously be a better choice than this video. Generally speaking, if you don't know the drone's intentions, it would be better to maneuver to better cover if it's close by, just in case. And finally, engage the platform if you can. If all else fails, you can attempt to engage the UAS with whatever small arms you have on hand. This is going to be largely an impossible task, especially with the proliferation of FPV drones which have incredible rates of speed. But for the drone that's carrying a mortar round and is more or less hovering over your position, you will have to decide what's the better move taking cover or engaging the threat that, if you somehow manage to hit, will probably crash directly over your position and explode anyway. But again, this will be highly situation dependent. So all in all, we can see that evading UAS platforms might be difficult, but it is certainly not impossible. We here fully expect smarter minds than ours to refine counter UAS doctrine even more over the coming years, especially taking into consideration the lessons learned in modern warfare and in modern civilian society. But for now, this quick collection of random tips will have to suffice in the absence of a more research-based deep dive on the topic. When trying to talk about topics at the bleeding edge of warfare innovation, we have to realize that sometimes screaming for a source will not exactly provide one. But for those interested in learning more about counter UAS doctrine, please check out these publications. So thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time. And as always, fight in the shade.